Hello and welcome to BitGardener's latest web seminar. Uh, my name is John Kowalski. I'm part of the marketing team here. And uh, today we're talking about the fundamentals of protective coatings inspection. Um, our speaker today, uh, Mr. Matt Fight, he is our business line manager for protective coatings. Um, also, we are recording this immediately following the presentation. You'll receive an automated marketing link uh, with that recording. Feel free to uh, share it with colleagues, uh, look at it uh, afterwards, whatever you'd like. Um, also, if you have any questions, please log them in the chat box located in the bottom right hand corner of your screen. And uh, we'll get to them either during the presentation, I'll interrupt Matt, and we, we can get those answered or uh, following as well. So. Uh, with that, welcome, and uh, a lot of good information coming your way. Matt, it's all yours, sir. Thank you. Hey, thanks, John. I appreciate the intro. You bet. Let's get going here. All right. Thanks, everybody, for joining. So this is going to be an overview of a uh, little bit of corrosion, a little bit of uh, steel formulation, a uh, little bit of inspection talk, talking about the roles of uh, quality assurance and quality control, and then the varying, I guess we can call them checkpoints to go into a uh, coding project, uh, but this can be relatable to a lot of different things. It just doesn't, you know, have to be uh, an industrial coding project. You know, these are are steps and checks that you can put in place if you're a, a fabrication shop, um, you know, manufacturing facility, uh, et cetera. So it's all relatable and, you know, kind of like John said, if there are any questions, feel free to, to punch them in there relevant to your own application. And we can either talk about them during the presentation or take them offline. We've done that on numerous occasions. So, all right, with that, let's get going here. So, you know, when you talk about codings, you're in today's terms, you're thinking about two things. You're thinking about appearance. You're thinking about gloss, color retention. Um, you know, what gets lost a little bit, the, the, the coatings, you know, whether it's on a bridge or tank or, or uh, lawnmower, as we learned during the last presentation, you know, they're really there to protect the substrate from corrosion. Uh, you know, uh, color and gloss are the appealing part of the system. You know, but it's really there to protect the substrate, you know, whether it's steel, concrete, wood, plaster, uh, even the walls in your house, you know, the, the paint is on that drywall for a reason and, uh, you know, make it cleanable, uh, durable, etc. So really does, you know, paint is all around us and it really does play a large portion in our lives. So for the purpose of this talk, we're going to talk uh, mainly about about hot rolled carbon steel. You know, steel holds up the buildings, bridges, hospitals, uh, everything around us has uh, steel involved. And corrosion is the biggest threat. It's, uh, you know, once you make the steel, it naturally wants to go back to its uh, initial state. So to touch on that, you know, you're turning iron ore into carbon steel by employing very high temps and a huge amount of energy. Uh, but on the flip side, the process of corrosion is very spontaneous and, you know, it doesn't require much more than electrolyte, an anode, a cathode, and a pathway. Uh, you know, all four of those items do have to be um, in place for uh, corrosion to occur. But in today's day and age, it's not really hard to find an environment uh, that doesn't provide the opportunity for corrosion. Um, you know, a little bit of a damp environment, oxygen and uh, away you go there. So there's many products, obviously, that can slow down corrosion, um, but you know, today we'll specifically be talking about industrial coatings as being the primary barrier for protection. And interestingly enough, um, you know, coatings isolate the substrate from the service environment. Uh, whether that's uh, a marine environment, atmospheric, uh, corrosive chemicals, et cetera, that is called barrier protection. And you can add rust inhibitors to the coating uh, that offer inhibitive protection, or, you know, I'm sure a lot of you are all familiar with zinc or sacrificial coatings. You know, the, the zinc will, will corrode first to protect the steel. Uh, hopefully then that would offer the 
the uh, asset owner the opportunity to get out there and do some maintenance work to uh, fix any any dings or damages that that you know kind of happen daily in uh, normal operating life and those are called sacrificial or galvanic protection so coatings have a you know a very long history um, you know specifically going back to they came in very popular use during uh, World War II uh, you know they weren't they weren't as aesthetically pleasing as they are nowadays but but they proved the purpose you know they knew the coatings offered a barrier to uh, to the numerous environments that the the ships and tanks and you know airplanes were exposed to whatever the case may be coatings really kind of took off around that point in time you know it must be noted and you know, if, if you had a, a magic genie, we would all create one paint that would do everything for every product and project, but it doesn't exist. So, you know, there's there's going to be different coding systems for different uh, protection in all different types of service environments. When you're talking about a coding system, you, you know, you have to talk about the beginning, uh, the middle and the end. So the life cycle of a coding system, uh, you know, if you can monitor it, you know, we always recommend that you have, um, um, you know, a maintenance program in place. You want to make sure that you can take that coding system to the uh, extent of its anticipated life. Uh, you know, for example, if, if a coding system is designed and tested for a specific service environment, you know, you're looking to get 20 years out of a system, providing it's maintained. Uh, you know, when you're applying that system and it starts to fail in the first year or two, uh, we can call that premature failure. And, you know, if you look at the bottom of these pictures, there's probably, you know, either issues here with uh, profile and or maybe surface contamination. But that's what we're going to focus on a lot today is the proper way to make sure the coding failures don't happen. All right, continuing on that topic, uh, not sure where this study came from, but I've seen this in numerous forms over the last 20 years, but the numbers are always somewhat similar. You know, 60 to 70% of coding failures or premature coding failures are uh, relatable to poor surface, poor surface preparation. Um, if you look at the rest of these, and we'll, we'll talk about these when we talk about inspection checkpoints as far as prep is concerned, uh, you know, job site conditions, excessive moisture, um, that is still related to the surface preparation, but it just has to do with ambient conditions. So that is very uh, of note that all these things kind of work hand in hand to uh, cause failures. And it must be noted they're avoidable. You know, everybody wants to push a project and keep it on schedule, et cetera. But, you know, if you don't have conditions, if you don't have the, the proper profile, and et cetera, you're going you're gonna to run into a bigger problem down the road. All right. So what makes for a good project? Um, there's a lot of elements that have to come together uh, at the same time. You know, the, the spec writer has to write the, the coding for the proper service environment. Uh, you're not going to, it's a funny example, but you're not going to specify house paint for a caustic, you know, chemical plant. Um, atmospheric conditions need to be uh, in spec for the work to proceed. That's a checkpoint. Uh, appropriate surface prep preparation and application equipment. You know, do you, do you have the right blasting units? Are you using the right nozzles, the right abrasive side? And can you get the paint, you get the coating to the surface with uh, the proper equipment? Uh, Well-trained laborers, well-defined and executed quality control and quality assurance programs. You know, we'll talk about this in extensively a little bit later, but you know, QC, the contractor, and QA representing the owner, you know, it, it all has to mesh, it all has to work hand in hand. And in that vein, you know, well-trained and experienced uh, should have that in there and ethical coatings inspectors. You know, it's, you're not there to, to dictate how a job goes, you're just there to make sure the job gets done properly. And last but not least, something near and dear to my heart, um, you know, properly maintained coating inspection equipment that functions properly and is uh, calibrated, um, you know, uh, 
uh, according to an ISO standard or you know, per the manufacturer standard. Very important. All right. So what do you hope to get out of the today's you know hour long presentation? I'm just going to talk talk to a few of these ones that I really want you all to focus on. You know what what is a twofold purpose of preparation? You know, we talked a little bit earlier. That is the main main cause of um, you know, any sort of uh, coding failure. How do we get the profile? Measure and record it. You know uh, evaluating surface cleanliness using uh, viz guides. Uh, we didn't really get into you know measuring soluble salt content up front you know we could probably do a whole another webinar on on uh, different means and methods to evaluate salt content specific ions etc but we're just going to talk about viz guides today recording the ambient conditions uh, always a fun one because it's not as easy as people think but you know understanding and how do you calculate the wet film thickness to get the proper dry film thickness uh, different types of uh, dry film thickness gauges. Uh, really hot topic, I think. You know, talking about verification of equipment versus calibration of equipment. Those words get used incorrectly a lot. Uh, I don't care what industry you're in. Uh, pinhole holiday detection and uh, adhesion adhesion testing. Uh, different methods to test the adhesive value of the coating system. So what is corrosion? Uh, NACE, formerly NACE, now AMP, A-M-P-P. -P. Uh, corrosion is the deterioration of a substance, usually a metal, or its properties because of a reaction to its environment. Uh, we said this a few times, but corrosion is a natural process. Uh, the, the material wants to give up energy and return back to its natural state. You know, we dig it up out of the ground, push it all together, heat it up, and and we get a finished product, but it really wants to go back to that natural state. It takes a tremendous amount of energy to convert the materials, the ore, into usable materials for construction, uh, but it will release that energy and go back unless it is protected. Talk about this a little bit already. You know, protective coatings are the most widely used uh, corrosion prevention method. Um, you know, offshore rigs, ships, storage tanks, power plants, anything you can think of, you see it down the road after this presentation, you're going to start looking at it. You know, wow, wow, is that, is that painted properly, et cetera? Uh, we talked about this earlier. Coatings have been around for a long time, uh, but it's a never ending, never ending battle. I mean that by talking about, you know, uh, better methods to, to correct protect our, our assets, uh, better formulations due to VOC regulations. Um, you know, coating manufacturers want to make products that are uh, better for the environment. I mean, I, I know just because we deal with it on a regular basis, these coating manufacturers, they spend a lot, uh, millions, if not billions of dollars in researching new products. And a lot of them never see the light of day. Um, so it's a, it's a very, intensive behind the scenes process that, that is never, that never stops. So what is steel? Uh, you know, consider the corrosion of carbon, carbon steel. Um, you can look at iron since it's a primary component. Uh, you know, steel is composed of iron at concentrations of 95 to 99%. In ordinary steel and pure iron, uh, you get the, you get the differentiation because their addition of carbon and other elements. So when you add different elements into iron, it increases the strength and adds other desirable properties to the metal. Um, you know, a variety of alloys are produced, adding such things as copper, chromium, nickel, etc. And they, these additions produce a significant reduction in the corrosion rate of steel alloys. I'm sure everybody on the call has heard about weathering steel, et cetera. But look at it this way. You know, there's a galvanic scale that describes um, the metals. Metals that easily corrode, you know, like zinc and magnesium, then you're, they're heading up the scale to the, I'm doing air quotes right now, to the noble materials such as like gold and platinum. On a scale like that, if you want to look at it in this manner, steel is somewhere in the middle. And that's why you have different formulations and everybody wants to see, uh, you know, um, a mill sheet 
when they when they order steel to make sure it's it's meeting their specifications. Uh, it's not you know there's hundreds if not thousands of different types of formulations for each different app, um, uh, application. And a lot of times I mentioned weathering steel a little bit ago. Weathering steel is actually made to be left uncoated, and as it basically ages or corrodes because it is a corrosion process, it turns a pretty cool looking purplish color, um, purple rusty looking color. But uh, weathering steel in and of itself can actually be painted as well to add a different layer of protection. All right, so you know, this is just a little bit of an example. Um, you know, we have a we have a pipe here with a some sort of a corrosion, anti-corrosion layer uh, called a zinc and, you know, maybe an epoxy mid coat and some sort of a urethane top coat. Uh, but, uh, you know, coatings function in three different ways as a barrier, sacrificial and uh, rust inhibitor. But the overall, you know, goal is to slow down corrosion and preserve the, the substrate. So since we're talking about basic coatings, we'll talk about barrier protection. Um, you know, it is a physical barrier. You know, you're putting a coating that dries on a surface that, that forms a physical barrier um, to the um, environment, to the conditions. You know, that's any coating is considered a barrier coating. Such prevention, air, water um, from reaching the substrate and, you know, just talk about real quick, you know, there, there are other coatings that have characteristics that enhance their protection. Um, MIO or aluminum flake coatings, you know, if you look down here at the bottom of the slide, these little MIO particles, you know, they, they kind of line up like little plates uh, in, the, in, the, uh, in the coating layer. So it takes the water uh, and air much longer to get down to the surface. It's kind of cool. All right, so you know we're talking about protective coatings, corrosion, inspection, and equipment. So what exactly uh, is the process of coating inspection? You get it tossed around a lot, but it's probably not well known um, as to what the process is. Quality is defined as the characteristics of a product or service that bear on its ability to satisfy stated or implied needs basically meet the specification requirements. Um, quality control, you know, QC, think of C as the contractor uh, or shop, et cetera. Um, this is the contractor's responsibility. And, you know, that just basically involves taking all the proper observation, test methods, et cetera, and documentation, real, real big uh, over the last decade or so. A lot of different programs that offer, you know, uh, digital documentation, a lot of the manufacturers of the equipment itself have their own um, uh, free databases that you can record and upload and make pretty uh, presentations with their software. Really good stuff. Quality assurance. Uh, quality assurance is, is generally performed uh, by a third party on behalf of the owner uh, or the owner itself. I mean, you know, some asset owners do have their own QA inspectors. So QA verifies that the quality performed by the contractor is basically what is being reported by the contractor. Uh, so they're, you know, kind of the big brother uh, looking over your shoulder, making sure everything is right, if you want to look at it in that regards. But the main point, whether it's QC or QA, you're just trying to meet, you know, notice I didn't say exceed, um, but in, in this realm, uh, coding, like I said before, whatever the structure or substrate is, you're trying to meet the specification that was written. Um, you know, whether it's the architect, engineer, uh, spec writer, coding manufacturer, they all have a basic fundamental idea as to what their coatings can do and what specific service environment. They put a lot of time and effort into making sure that those things happen. So, you know, whatever your role is, you just want to make sure that the, the coating is going to work the way it is intended to work. All right, OADR, observe, assess, document, and report. Um, you know, you observe the work performed by the contractor, whether it performed meets, once again, meets the requirements of the spec, 
document the results and uh, report well there is frequency in the progress and quality in relation to the spec you know there, there are specific areas of a spec that you have to do the, the testing etc but i want to touch just a little bit more about this you know inspectors on a project project usually in the qa role you know they can have a significant influence on a project and it's a good good practice whether you're qc or qa to be on the same page meaning work schedules, production schedules, et cetera. Everything is clearly communicated. Um, you know, I've personally seen and been on both sides of contentious type of, you know, job sites that it's not fun. You know, it's not fun because you don't really know the backstory coming in, you know, to a situation from the outside. And, you know, I, I think it all stems from the beginning, you know, job meetings, you know, pre-job meetings, making sure everybody's on the same page with, the specification, calling out stuff that doesn't look right or feel right. Uh, all of this stuff really leads up to, you know, how a project is going to go. And if you're off on the wrong foot at the beginning, it could be a long, long project. So that's, you know, the main point or main takeaway is QA and QC, you know, they should have a good working relationship. You know, I'm not speaking anything about out of work relationships, but on the job site, be professional and understand that both both parties want to get the project completed on time and most importantly obviously on budget all right now we're through that fun stuff let's talk about surface preparation um, preparation is twofold you know you're cleaning the substrate uh, you're making sure there are no contaminants uh, on the substrate uh, in our in, in, you know, in the protective coatings world, you know, salts, you're going to hear it until you're blue in the face or your ears fall off. Salt, salt, salt. But it could be numerous, numerous contamination. So you want to make sure the substrate is clean beforehand and then the roughening of the surface. Um, so the prep of a steel substrate prior to application. Um, if you if you don't take this away from the from the presentation, that's on you. But <laughs> The most critical part is the uh, surface preparation step. It's going to give you that canvas. It's going to give that coating the best opportunity to uh, succeed. Um, yeah, right. I mean, the final preparation of substrate will determine the surface life of the coating system. Well, I mean, that's one factor. We talked about maintenance and upkeep uh, later on down the road. Um, but yeah, that's it's very important. All right, what are we doing prior to surface uh, preparation? You know, you're checking your conditions. The ambient conditions are very important. Uh, surface cleanliness, as we've spoke to, and profile. All right, conditions. Um, conditions such as air temperature, moisture content of the air expressed as relative humidity, uh, temperature with which condensation will occur expressed as dew point. Uh, these are all very specific uh, and important parts of the specification, not only from uh, the specification documents, but uh, if you look at the bottom line there, all coating manufacturers, I, I really don't care who it is, what it is, what type of paint. If you look on a product data sheet or even on the side of a can, you know, these labels will have the, the range of conditions requirements that they specify for the best performance of their coatings. You know, it's going to impede drying, um, all kind of different things if you put it on at incorrect conditions. That's where you're going to get your premature failures that we we're talking about before. All right. You know, you're measuring the temperatures, make sure that the, the, co the coating system um, works properly. I already talked about this, but air temp, RH, and dew point are the three biggies. Uh, don't forget about the surface temperature because there, there has to be a variance of, I believe, 5F between the surface and the dew point. I think that is what the uh, number is that water will condense on the surface. So if you don't have a five or a delta five, that's when you're uh, going to run into issues. I'm sure somebody is fact checking me right now. <laughs> Okay, now we'll start talking about equipment. Um, you know, as funny as it is, you know, the old Bacharach sling psychrometer there on the left-hand side with the, 
psychometric tables from the 30s, I believe. Um, you know, the, it's still a tried and true method. Um, it's still taught going through inspection classes at AMP, NACE, SSPC, whatever you want to call it. I believe it is taught internationally through Frozio. I have to reach out to some of my colleagues about that. But, you know, it's, 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 a, good, it's a good piece of equipment. You know, there's not any digital uh, parts or pieces that could go wrong with it. You know, you're, you're basically, you're going to take that thing out of your, your case. You're going to inspect the bulbs to make sure there's no cracks or they're not broken. You're going to check the wick at the top of the, the unit there that transfers the moisture from the wick, the well, uh, to the bulb. That's going to be your wet bulb. Okay. So that little cap, well, it's at the bottom of the picture, but the cap at the bottom is, is called the reserve. And in there, you're going to see the sock or the wick. And you take the cap off. You check that wick to make sure it's clean and not dirty or crusty because that will impede the water um, going down the wick. You put your water in there, you know, DI water or whatever case may be, put the cap back on. And then you simply whirl. That's why they call them whirling psychrometers. You whirl it, a, a, you know, away from your body so you don't pick up your body temperature in increments of 20 to 30 seconds until you get two stabilized readings in a row. Usually takes about three times. Sometimes it can take two times. So then you record your wet bulb. That's the one that has the, the wick on it, which is obviously uh, gonna be on uh, the cooler side. And then you record your dry bulb. And then you open up your psychometric chart there. You find, uh, very important, you have to find what barometric pressure you're at. Uh, you know, typically it's, you know, uh, 30, but we all have the, the old Google Nader on our phones. So you can simply Google what is my barometric pressure. You find the corresponding chart in this book, and then you know you, you can decipher your readings. Uh, on the right-hand side, we have a digital hygrometer, uh, typically called a dew point meter, that basically, you know, instantaneously gives you all those readings right on hand. Uh, if you look at this screen, this particular model, you know, it shows you the, the relative humidity, the air temperature, surface temperature by touching the bottom down to the substrate, and it gives you the uh, dew point meter. And right here, the important factor, it calculates the spread between the surface and the dew point. Now, one thing, a couple things I want to point out here. Uh, these things, they're, they're very... Uh, uh, they're, they're digital meters, and, and in the head at the bottom down there, there's sensors, okay? And those sensors are very um, touchy, let's put it that way. So you can't just, when you get to a job site, you know, whether that's in a shop or, or whatever, you know, wherever this piece of equipment is being stored, you have to take that to the area of work to be performed, whether it's a job site, you know, hanging off a bridge or a water tower or simply in a shop, and you have to let these things acclimate. I don't care what, what brand it is, you know, the, the gauge itself has to power up and just sit around for 15 to 20 minutes because it cannot go from a, you know, like a, a nice cool air conditioned truck out to a very, you know, somewhat humid job site. It just doesn't record the readings properly. So acclimation, very key. Um, another cool point, and we found this after years of trial and error in working with these things and selling these things and calibrating these things, um, these sensors dry out. Uh, they're, you know, really whatever the manufacturer is, they're, uh, they're made by a few um, chip manufacturers, and they all dry out. Uh, so if you know you're not going to use your gauge for an extended amount of time, uh, we recommend people storing them in a Ziploc bag with a damp, not a wet, but just a damp towel. It'll help keep it hydrated. And, uh, you know, that'll extend, you know, it'll extend the uh, life of the sensor. We've gotten them back in, you know, say a calibration period is one year. You know, we've gotten them back in a few months saying, hey, this thing's broken. Well, you let it dry out. You know, you smoked it in a truck or on a dashboard or something. And that's what happens. So, the, you know, while these things are great, and they do provide you know fast results when used properly. They're temperamental. You really got to watch how you you take care of them, just like anything, I guess. 
So commonly used uh, equipment to measure conditions. We talked about the sling. We talked about electric psychrometers or digital hygrometers. Um, you know, another old school, you know, well tried and true and still used to this day. A uh, little uh, magnetic surface temperature gauges. You know, just slap it on a piece of steel and that's that's going to give you your reading. Uh, real big in the rail car industry still. Uh, just cheap and dirty and get you your reading. Make sure you're within within your range. Uh, IR guns, digital surface temperature, uh, non-contact IR guns are a very nice tool. Um, you know, once again, there's some restrictions and uh, limitations on how you use these things, the length of the measurement that you're trying to take. Um, that could be a whole nother discussion talking about emissivity and uh, spot and etc. cetera. Uh, then on the lower right, I mean, this isn't as common in the protective coatings world as far as like, you know, field applications, but these are, are oven digital data, data recorders. You, know, you can put these things in, you know, if you have a spray booth or baking line or whatever, uh, you can actually place these things, temperature probes in there and it'll record your conditions for you. You can literally go on here and set your parameters. And if you have a spike, if you have a spike in your conditions, it alerts you immediately. Or it'll record it and you come in the next day and you know you can see the results. So all kind of different ways to monitor uh, your ambient conditions. All right. Um, so quite a few slides ago, we talked about different methods to verify surface cleanliness, uh, but I just want to talk a few seconds about the another important portion that we didn't have in this presentation. Uh, you know, talking about you know soluble salts. You know, you before you even get to the process of abrasive blasting or, or hand tool cleaning, um, there's an important step that you're going to do is to measure your soluble salt content. Uh, numerous methods, you know, you're probably familiar with the Bresley, Bresley patch, Chlor test uh, has numerous uh, different methods. But the point is you want to check your soluble salt levels if there's a need to have a power washing or, you know, a lot of different companies make uh, salt remover washes um, to uh, apply, then power wash off. And then you retest using a Bresley method or Chlor test. And then after that has passed, then you can move into your surface um, abrasive blasting. Okay, surface cleanliness. Um, we'll just talk about the VIS-1 and VIS-3 guides right now. So very, very long time ago, uh, SSPC, now part of AMP, uh, they, they established what became the industry standard um, as far as visual representation of blast conditions. I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but you know, SP5 is a white metal, uh, SP10 is a near white. So somebody wrote us back and said, uh, you can have some surface rusting or some uh, tightly adhering mill scale or, or old coating. Well, it was a huge point of contention on a job site. You know, what is what? What passes, you know, a lot of times stuff would just get blasted down to bare metal. Um, why the hell didn't you say that in the first point? You know? But um, so SSPC established with the help of you know numerous reputable uh, companies in the organization, these different standards. Uh, I want to say they take the guesswork out of it because it still is a uh, qualitative test. You know, my eyes may be different than somebody else's eyes, but you know, VIS-1 are, you know, it's representations of what is prepared by abrasive blasting and VIS-3 are surfaces prepared by power and hand tool cleaning. And if you look at the lower right hand here, I believe this is supposed to be a weld, not a great picture, I apologize. Um, but just different ways to verify uh, that the cleanliness standard uh, has been met. So, it must be noted that this is just an inspection done with the unaided eye, um, you know, nor, not magnification, sorry, I should say, and or not magnification. So you're literally just holding, you know, the, the standard there up to the surface, you know, standing at arm length and saying, does it meet or does it not meet the cleanliness standard? So it is still subjective.
All right, profile. Love talking profile. So profile, surface profile is defined as the maximum peak to valley depth that is created during the surface preparation process. Anchor pattern, as you also hear it called, uh, it's typically um, generated by abrasive blast cleaning and not so much in the industrial world, but power tool cleaning uh, methods. Um, you know, when you're looking at a, a coating spec, there's going to be a min and a max surface profile requirement. A uh, little tip, and this goes back to the pre-job meetings if you're reading the specification, um, whether it's profile or dry film thickness, you know, it should never be an on the number, meaning three, you know, three mils. I, I don't care how good you are, and I've, I've met and you know, worked with and been friends with a lot of great abrasive blasters and a lot of great coatings applicators. Um, but if a spec calls for an on the number, you better get that clarified real quick. You know, this, for example, you know, three, it should read say two to four. And on that specification, typically there's a, a plus or minus percent um, on either end, more so in the, in the uh, coding side, application side of thing. But, you know, never, never accept the spec that says uh, on the number. So, Common factors, you know, as you're, you know, you got your abrasive blasting unit, you know, you checked your lines for moisture content, oil content, you know, you have the right nozzle, nozzle size, orifice size, and uh, you know you're using the right abrasive, or you think you do, um, you know, you're going to check your abrasive, you know, what was specified, grit, shot, or sand, um, the hardness and size of the media, and, you know, as well as the hardness of the surface to be prepared, you know. Varying types of steel have varying uh, types of hardness, and you know uh, certain abrasives. You know you could stand there all day and waste a lot of, a lot of man hours and a lot of abrasive just trying to get something that you know you probably need a different size or a different type of abrasive. Um, so a lower profile, you know, is typically going to take a smaller abrasive, where a deeper profile, uh, you know, it's going to accept a metalizing coating or something like that, uh, will take a larger abrasive. Kind of, kind of intuitive, but you know, still has to be stated. And there's a lot of mixes. You know, you can mix a lot of the abrasives to to get uh, specific profiles. It's it's very impressive. Um, you know, when you see a good applicator or a good, uh, you know, a good abrasive blaster that knows what they're doing. They they know what what abrasive mix to get their profile and what pressure. All right, so after we go through all that and we got our profile, now we have to measure it, make sure it meets the actual uh, specification. So ASTM D4417 uh, calls out three methods, um, been around for a long, long time. Um, method A, uh, visual surface profile comparators. If you look in the lower left-hand corner here, uh, basically these are disks that have uh, varying degrees, varying mills of surface profile, uh, you know, shot, grit, and sand. And then, you know, I, I forget what the tabs are, but one tab may be one, the next one may be two, three, four, five, et cetera. But you literally attach it to the end of your, either a 5X or 10X magnifier, and you place it up against the surface, and you can see the surface in the little hole through the middle there and you pick which number it is closest to on the uh, disc. Um, obviously, once again, that's a qualitative, you know, my eyes may say something differently than yours, but a lot of times, you know, this is used in the, you know, when somebody is actually blasting, when somebody is, uh, you know, running through the process of putting the profile on, you can do this as a quick check and say, yeah, okay, I'll, you know, I'm, I'm in the range or I'm pretty close. Um, Method B, uh, surface profile depth gauge. Um, you know, when you're talking about, they're called SPGs, you know, there, there's still a process that has to go through to make sure that these gauges are working properly. Um, every manufacturer is gonna supply you with a glass plate, a glass shim, that prior to every use, uh, every, you know, say every shift, uh, you're gonna wanna zero this gauge out there's a process internally that walks you through it. And then most of them supply you with what's called a horseshoe shim. So you take that shim and you put it on the plate 
and you measure through the middle and it will verify that your gauge is reading properly. Notice I'm talking verification and not calibration. Then you take your readings and uh, move on from there. Uh, method C is replica tape and a replica tape has also been around for quite a long time. Uh, what replica tape is, is basically it is a compressible foam that you place on the abrasively blasted steel. You can see this little burnishing tool here. Uh, it's a stainless steel burnishing tool, which is very nice. A lot of time you literally see bar swizzle sticks out there. Um, but you, you burnish the center until it's a nice gray consistent color. And then you use on the right here what is called a uh, spring micrometer. Um, uh, to actually measure the profile. Uh, in the anvils down here, it actually measures the compressed profile of that foam. Now, just a quick tip, if you want more information, I can share later on, but there are two mils of uh, mylar on here that have to be deducted from the reading. So typically what you do, if you have your, have your gauge set at zero, uh, a, lot of, a lot of end users or inspectors will simply dial the gauge back two mils. Okay, so then the reading you take, you don't got to do the math. I don't like math, so I prefer the easiest ways to do things. So that's just a, a quick little tip there. Let me see here. All right, so I want to talk a little bit more about profile and what the difference is. Uh, obviously, with a method A, you know, you're not providing um, any results. You know, you're not going to be able to put that on a report because it's uh, qualitative, it's subjective, <clears throat> sorry. But, you know, with a depth gauge, with a profile gauge, you know, there's probably gonna be somewhere called out SSPC PA17 or whatever, that, that's just kind of an industry standard, but most specifications will tell the frequency uh, of what is to be measured. So, you know, say in a specific area, you know, with an SPG gauge, you're gonna wanna take 10 readings per area and you know some specs will say okay record the max and you're going to throw out any outliers because when you're measuring blasted steel I, I tried to get you know if you look at the previous slide there's it's kind of a nasty looking you know if you think armageddon remember the movie armageddon that's kind of what a blasted piece of steel looks like jagged it's all over the place peaks and valleys you're going to catch some flyers as it's called so you may get some tens or twelves or even zeros if you catch a right on a peak. So you throw the oddballs out and you know record the max of those ten readings. Another way to do it, if it's agreed upon, and you know I, I see this a lot as well. If it's agreed upon, you can say, hey, per area, uh, let's do ten and take the average um, of those readings. Uh, some people say that that's a true representation uh, of that specific area. Uh, with a replica tape, um, per area, you're going to take two readings, two tape readings um, per area <clears throat> and average those two readings. Now, we don't have enough time uh, to get into it, but there is a different way if you, if you look or if you know anything about replica tape. There's a few different flavors, uh, coarse minus, coarse, and uh, extra coarse that all have their own unique measuring range. Um, there's a lot of things that go on if, if you land in one zone, do you take another reading or do you use, you know, use that reading or do you cross them over? Um, but it's tried and true. It's been around for a long time and these, these results, these tape results last forever. You know, we've pulled out inspection reports from 30 years ago and you can still put them on a mic them on the, uh, test X gauge and it, it still reads as it says it does in a report. So it's pretty cool. But that's enough. All right. Wet film thickness. All right. So we know most specifications should, they better, indicate the uh, anticipated dry film thickness or DFT, as we'll call it moving forward um, for each layer of paint. If there's subsequent layers to be applied. Um, but however, unless you know, you're know you using 100% solids material like in a secondary containment situation or whatever, uh, a lot of specs don't call out what the wet film thickness of the coating should be. Um, why is that important? Well, I mean, you know, 
stuff costs a lot of money, right? You know, you don't want to redo it. You don't want to have excessive DFT build. Um, so the wet film to achieve the, you know, the desired dry film is actually very important. Um, so there, there's two formulas that you need to know uh, when calculating what wet film thickness should be to achieve your DFT. Formula A is with no thinner added. So you take the anticipated DFT, say five mils, and you divide that by the percent volume solids of the material. Say that's, I don't know, 50% volume solid. So five mils anticipated DFT, you divide that by 50% volume solids, and that's gonna give you an anticipated wet film application of 10 mils. Pretty, pretty cut and dry, pretty simple, right? Okay. Fun one is formula B, and if we have any you know, industrial coders on here, whatever you know, that you're gonna add thinner uh, to make it spray or flow or dry faster or whatever the case may be. Um, okay, the first step is you take the volume solids of the material, the known volume solids, and you divide that by 100% plus the percent of thinner to be added. That gives you your adjusted volume solids. So simply go back to step A here. Uh, to achieve that, you take the anticipated dry film thickness and you divide that by the adjusted volume solids. And that's going to give you your wet film thickness goal. Um, once again, keep in mind, you know, we're talking about a range here. So, you know, saying five anticipated means they're going to give me 10, blah, blah, blah. You know, there's ranges for all this stuff, uh, just because common sense says it's pretty darn hard to hit stuff on in the number. So I thought that would be pretty cool to throw in here today. All right. So the wet film thickness, uh, well, you know, we, we talked about how you get there, but how do you measure it? Uh, so immediately after the wet coating is applied, you know, you're, you're going to insert these little comb, comb gauges, as we call them right into the paint down to the surface perpendicular uh, not in an angle but perpendicular to the surface uh, you remove the gauge from the film and the two end teeth that you know went down to the surface should have coating on them and you note in the middle of your range the highest number tooth that has paint on it that's your wet film thickness i mean that's it you know there's it's not not much to this I can say that that when you're doing this, you're going to want to get into the proper range. I mean, you're, you know, as a good applicator, you're going to know, okay, I'm, I'm six to 10 mil, so I'm going to use the four to 10 mil comb. Um, if, in fact, you get to the 10 and you have paint covering it, you may want to switch it over and go to the next comb, go to the next side just to make sure. So if you, if you cover all your combs up, you may want to go to the next higher level. Just a friendly rule of thumb there. All right, DFT. Everybody loves dry film thickness. It's probably the most talked about, written about, you know, videoed about uh, part of uh, any sort of uh, coating inspection. You know, like I said earlier, not just for industrial coating projects, but if you if you make any product and you paint it, you know, you're you're going to want to measure the dry film thickness. You know, there's DFTs for, for steel, plastic, concrete, um, you know, wood, uh, drywall. I mean, we could, like I said before, we could spend a whole day talking about DFTs. But for this matter, we're just going to talk about, you know, for industrial applications, pipeline applications, whatever. Um, <clears throat> what is a DFT and what types are there? So we've talked about this quite a few times, but the product data sheets are going to indicate the min and the max DFTs for each paint layer. Um, you know, a very cool note, or must be noted, that this represents the range of the coating film that is above the peaks of the substrate or profile, above the profile. So your film thicknesses are measured above the peaks of your surface profile, not what penetrates down into the actual anchor pattern. Okay. So DFTs uh, can be measured by two means or two types of gauges. I guess there's many means to measure DFTs if we're talking destructive, tilt gauge, etc. 
but uh, type one gauges are classified as magnetic pull-off gauges, uh, typically referred to as a banana gauge. They've been around a long, long time. Um, you know, historically they're very durable. They, you know, guys bang them, drop them, keep on ticking, uh, as long as you're verifying the accuracy of the gauges. Uh, they're less expensive. And, you know, quite honestly, much like using a good old sling psychrometer for conditions, there's less stuff internally that can go wrong uh, as opposed to a digital gauge. Type two digital gauges, um, you know, they're faster. You know, a lot of them have scanning probes now. They can take hundreds of readings uh, in a relatively short amount of time. Um, typically, their stated accuracies are, are, are better. Uh, they're versatile. You know, a lot of gauges, you can measure ferrous and non-ferrous materials without even thinking about it. You know, the gauge just knows which type of substrate it is and, and changes accordingly. Um, you know, very, very, um, come a long way, let's just say in the last 20 years. Um, see many variations from all the different major manufacturers and it's pretty cool stuff. Uh, I mean, geez, just, you know, just like coating manufacturers are always trying to update their 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 products i mean you know the major manufacturers of the inspection products are always working as well so you don't want to get left behind so in you know as far as industrial coating projects are concerned um and i think astm d7091 is followed um, more more across the industry as well but anyways there's two recognized standards uh for verification of accuracy and calibration in measurement, you know, frequency of measurement. Uh, D7091, standard practice for non-destructive measurement of dry film thickness uh, to ferrous metals. In SSPC PA2, uh, it's procedure for determining conformance to dry coating thickness requirements. Not gonna spend a lot of time getting into SSPC PA2, but uh, there's a lot of, very intelligent people, very engaged in the in the industry. I had the pleasure of working with with many of them. They basically came together and said, "Okay, you know, there's a lot of people saying, well, I take 20 readings. Well, I take five readings. I take two readings.'" They put together a procedure, a written standard that was voted across uh, numerous people in the industry that said, "You know, you take X amount of readings for X square feet. Then after that first square feet, you know, continue on out and take you know 10 readings, whatever." don't have enough time to completely go over it, but there's a lot of good talks out there on how to follow the PA2. All right, so we talked earlier, you know, we just talked about the products that are used to measure dry film thickness, but I really want to touch on this subject because it's, it is probably the most contested uh, statement in the world as far as uh, dry film thickness is concerned. And we'll talk about verification of accuracy. So, you know, you're going to want to, whether, like I said, you work in a shop setting or you're a contractor, or, you know, QC, QA, whatever, you want to verify that your equipment is working properly, right? So the practice of verifying gauge accuracy, um, you're using certified coding standards uh, that have measured values traceable to, you know, whatever a known institute, such as NIST. Uh, NIST has been around for a long time. They're still in. I believe they still manufacture coating thickness standards. Um, but you're verifying the accuracy in the intended range of the coating thickness to be measured. So just think about it logically. You know, if I'm measuring an intumescent coating that, you know, dry film anticipated at 250, you know, I'm not going to use my gauge and try to verify accuracy at 10 mils. You know, just you just want to use your use your smarts about you. Um, you know. I've never seen a coating thickness standard. You see the NIST plates down here. I've never seen a standard go up that high, but you can add shims and different things like that to try to get closer to, to your anticipated range. So according to 7091, you are permitted to adjust your type two gauge. Remember the, the type one, the banana gauge down here in the middle is not adjustable, but the type two gauges, you're allowed to adjust the gauge so the readings agree with the certified standard. If the gauge continuously reads outside of tolerance, then you can return the gauge to service, for service, sorry. All right, so what does that mean? So you gotta remember what I talked about before. Um, 
you know, a gauge has a specific accuracy. These coating thickness standards have a specific accuracy. So once again, ASTM came up with a formula to say, if your gauge reads this criteria on this specific plate, then it's good to go. You can go to work with that gauge. So how do we do that? You take the square root of gauge accuracy squared plus plate accuracy squared equals your combined accuracy. For example, if a gauge has a stated accuracy of 7% and the coded standard has a stated accuracy of 7%, then the gauge reading on the standard can be considered accurate if the unit reads within 9% of the stated thickness of the standard. So on a 10 mil shim or a 10 mil plate, sorry, a gauge that reads from 9.1 to 10.9 is considered within range. And here's that formula right there. Now you're probably getting barked at right now. That's 7% is a pretty, uh, pretty, pretty loose uh, stated accuracy, but you know, it's just, just the one that I used. So keep that in mind. You know, we're, we're not talking calibration. Talk calibration. Calibration is a controlled process that is performed by the manufacturer or by an authorized service facility, okay? So you'll hear people say, well, I calibrated my gauge. No, no, you didn't. You verified the accuracy of your gauge. Calibration, again, can only be performed by the manufacturer or a laboratory, okay? That's your one takeaway. I want you to use those words properly, please. <laughs> Okay, getting close to it here, John. I, I can hear you shuffling. Um, holiday detection. All right. So holidays, uh, you know, this is obviously after the, the film is, 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 is applied and cured, or maybe not cured, actually in certain situations. I shouldn't have said that. I apologize. Uh, holidays are skips or misses in the coding system. Uh, you know, these misses permit easy access for the elements to hit the surface, and that's where you're going to see your mainly see your corrosion. Um, uh, conditions are created by the lack of detail by the applicator uh, and the configuration of a structure or part. You know, sometimes you look at bridge spans or the, I forget what the darn turn is, but you know, there's certain areas that just aren't put together to make it easy to paint them. I mean, it's, that's just is what it is. You see a lot of edge failure, crevice failure, et cetera. Um, but holiday detection uh, is typically performed after the final coat has been applied, but before it is completely cured. There we go. So if you need to, you know, touch it up or do re repair work, you can. You don't have to worry about any additional prep work that needs to be done to that coating system. All right. And it also must be noted that holiday detection can be specified, uh, you know, for different layers of a coating system. So there are two different methods uh, for, for holiday testing, a low voltage or a wet sponge detector. You see down here in the lower left-hand side, uh, it's typically performed with coating systems that are less than 20 mils. And high voltage, or tip, you know, also called Jeep testers, because they make a loud jeep, jeep, jeep sound when you, when you hit a, a holiday. Um, these are typically applied or used on systems that are greater than 20 mils. But Coating manufacturers can recommend high voltage detection for systems less than 20 mils. Verify that with the coating manufacturer. Um, double verified, in fact, because you can really, you know, if you're using the improper um, ampage, uh, you can really smoke a coating. I've seen it done. It's, it's very interesting, actually. All right. And the last step of any you know, any project, and this isn't always specified because why would you want to mess up a good coding system? Um, typically, it's going to be used maybe in, in an assessment of an existing system, uh, but adhesion, adhesion testing. Uh, adhesion testing is going to be applied if specified after the final coat has cured. Uh, as I just said, this is a common assessment tool used to evaluate a uh, condition of a coding system. It's been on for a period of time. Um, you know, a lot of coding consultants or whatever that are working for the owner, you know, they'll go out there and test adhesion at different spots and say, yeah, you got to replace this or no, nah, you know, what, just, you know, clean it, rough it up and overcoat it. Um, 
So some common terms when talking about ad adhesion. Adhesive, it's the strength of the coating system or the bond of the layers to one another and the surface, okay? So that's when it pulls off of the substrate. Cohesive, the cohesive strength of a system is the ability of the layers to hold themselves together. So how well do they stick together? Kind of a tricky, well, not tricky if you know what you're you know, looking at, but these words get used interchangeably again. Um, not common, as commonly talked about with adhesion and cohesion, but glue, um, you know, the adhesion cohesion of the system, it's going to exceed the strength of the glue. So you get what is called glue failure, you know, just that dolly just comes ripping off of there. This is uh, that, that glue terminology is only used for the, uh, um, portable adhesion testers with dollies. Uh, so that's called a glue failure and you may or may not want to retest it, you know, if it, uh, I think most of the glues will give you some sort of a PSI range uh, that they're going to call out failure. Um, but, you know, a lot of people say, hey, good enough. You know, we're not going to test anymore. So ASTM, you know, the real standards uh, that, that get measured, uh, D3359, that is the adhesion by tape test. Uh, there is method A, which is the cross-cut uh, test. So if you look down towards the middle here, this is actually a slide representing another test, knife adhesion, but this is basically what you do. You have a guide or you have a straight edge ruler. You make uh, X cut down through the coating to the substrate, uh, about an inch and a half long per leg, as they're called. And I think in the middle here, you want your X value uh, to be between 30 and 40 or 30 and 45 degrees. And the tips, of your X want to be around an inch wide so that the adhesion, I'll still call it permacell tape, I don't care. The permacell tape covers the tips of each X. So you apply the tape, put it down with, you know, make sure it's down with a back end of an eraser. And within 30 seconds, that's the dwell time, 30 seconds, you peel, peel the tape back off. And then there are certain criteria and charts and everything that you can uh, assess the adhesion. Method B over here on the left is coatings that are less than five mils. Uh, you all probably know it's probably called a cross hatch or um, you know, hatch test. Uh, so what you do is you, you also have a guide that specifically whatever the millage is, uh, is going to state out you know, what the, the width of these cuts are. I said there's guides for that. Put your cuts through the system, same thing, adhere the tape to it, pull it off, and then you evaluate it, okay? Pretty easy. Uh, this is the D6677 knife adhesion test is kind of, it's, it's a good tool um, for, you know, inspectors or consultants to measure the adhesion of a coating system. I've been in a lot of interesting arguments and conversation about what method is best but basically it's the same process as for you put an x through the coating system uh, you hear this referred to as the pick test because you basically pick at the intersection uh, with the tip of your blade and you try to figure out how it sticks um, you know my uh, you know they they say there's some results to be had there but i think it's qualitative you know uh 45 41 and d7234 are uh, pull off uh, test using portable adhesion testers with dollies 45 41 is used for steel applications and d7234 is used for concrete uh steel you have various size dollies that you can use uh, depending on the the size of the part part of piece or pipe or whatever um and D7234, most concrete applications are 50 millimeter dollies. Uh, last thing I wanna talk about, um, with gluing dollies to steel, uh, there's, you know, you wanna make sure in the specification what the process is. You know, typically you're just gonna glue that dolly to the steel, let the cure happen, and then you run your adhesion test. Uh, but every once in a while, the specification will call for a scoring there's a scoring tool that you can score around the the coating 
um, around the dolly to get the coating down to bare metal. Uh, it's not very common. That's argued about a lot too. And I always just say, what's it called out in the spec? Uh, but with 7234, with the concrete, you always score the coating down to the concrete. So just two, two last pointers there. And that is about it. I know we're a little bit over, but you know, hopefully, hopefully that was enough information for this overview. And you know, like John said earlier, if there's anything that you need clarification on or you think would be a, a really good additional presentation, let us know. We you know we can put it together and talk about it. Yeah. So that's it, Excellent. John. I uh, I appreciate it, sir. Excellent stuff. This was a great um kind of in-depth overview um you explain things very well um, i learned a whole bunch of stuff so um, i just really appreciate your time and expertise matt um, yeah, not a problem man. and uh like matt said um if anyone has any questions after the fact just hit reply to any of the automated marketing messages we'll route it to uh, matt or someone on the team and uh, get, get you hooked up there um, but thank you, and uh, we look forward to seeing you on a future Big Gardener webinar. Have a great afternoon, everyone. Thanks again, Matt. Appreciate it. No problem, man. Thank you. You bet. Bye bye.